Beautiful. Yes, I can hear. So here we go. Okay, ready? Yeah, you are good to go, Mike. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming into our uh, new training uh, facility here. I'm glad we got some lunch. Appreciate it. I'm Mike Hobbs. I'm going to be talking for a little bit uh, today uh, about uh, everybody your assessed value with the, uh, the, the assessed the assessments that we have. Panel here is uh, Sean and Sean Glenn here. And I have uh, Ryan DeMar, who's a general contractor. Sean is an attorney. Sean's got her cards here. It's kind of a litigious event that's going on right now. But a lot of emotion running high, so I wanted to make here. The modality we're going to talk about in, in the lunch learning today uh, involves a contractor, so I have Ryan here to talk about that if you have questions afterwards. And we are a, a technologies company, we're headed in that direction, so high tech. And with that, I want you to uh, make notes, if you would, on our little uh, sticky notes uh, there. We're such a high tech company that we try to do all the sticky notes and come back in time. But that's what you can use to write down the questions you have for later. So that's our, our technology today. Um, my background, I've been doing this 38 years in real estate, mortgage, and legal. And uh, during the time I had a law firm, not an attorney, like Sean is, but I started the law firm. Uh, I had the modality for it. What we did was uh, my design. And so what we did was we battled valuations uh, against or when there was a different opinion with the banks. And so I've written briefs and done all these things, and I created a, a particular uh, modality that's in the form of an executive summary to help the bank at that time and or the assessor's office, and that's why we're here today, to understand how that goes. So we're going to talk about that. So I have uh, did radio for, gosh, almost 20 years, Rebel Realtors Radio, Mortgage and Addicts was a show I had, did the Telly Award-winning movie uh, based on the stone this and mortgage financing. In my background over 30 years has primarily been in mortgage, but again, a bit of it in legal, and then I've owned a couple of real estate companies, and I've also owned an escrow company as well, so well-versed in all aspects of it. But I find a passion in, in really doing what we're here to do today. I think that, uh, without further ado, I think we've got a guest, don't we, Keith, that wanted to chime in for a bit? I'm confirming that, yes. Okay, I think so. We have the uh, county assessor that's going to jump on for a minute. Bella, are you there? This point, I am right. here. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Welcome. Yeah, I, I had to unmute myself. Sorry about that. Gotcha. Can you hit the plus button on that, Ryan? Perfect. Go for it. So our, our guest here today, guys, is uh, Bella Kosva, uh, our Kootenai County Assessor. And um, one question that came up, or one conversation piece that came up at the Realtor Association uh, just this week was um, everybody was up in arms about, hey, why does the assessor have our sole data? And um, Bella wanted to just have the opportunity to come address that question as well as uh, just say that they're here on our side. So if you guys have any questions or queries, definitely hit them up. So Bella, take it away. Uh, okay, yeah, thank you very much for that, Keith. Um, so that's a question that does come up. Uh, as you can imagine, we get the public coming in and, and their emotions are running high. They get their assessment notices and, and, and they come in to check on, to see what they can do. They wanna contest their values or they wanna verify or find out whether their information is correct or, or incorrect. And more often than not, the question comes up, uh, uh, where did you get the sales information? Uh, how did you know what my, my property was valued at? And, and the truth of the matter is, and the reality is, is there, there is a contract. Uh, it's, a, it's a mutual exchange contract. Um, it has been in place for, uh, well, since 1993, um, as far as I can tell. Um, it's a mutual uh, uh, exchange contract whereby the MLS gets property parcel information from the county. And in exchange for that, the county receives the sold price data information from the MLS. Um, it, it really comes down to a, a, a matter of, of statistical analysis, which is what mass appraisal is. Um, and as you all, as we all know from our, our statistics class that we took in high school or college, that the larger you increase your sample size, the more accurate you will be in terms of statistical analysis. Um, but uh, the, it's kind of the elephant in the room conversation because when that topic comes up in our office, uh, people are really surprised. Sometimes they seem upset. And, and I'm, I'm a little bit surprised 
why the question persists. Uh, my background, I, I was a realtor. Uh, I've, I've been a realtor for 20 years. I am I went inactive when I became the assessor, so I, I no longer practice. Um, and um, I remember getting trained when I got my license uh, that uh, I was told at the time, uh, when you go down to the assessor's office, do not tell them what you sold your, your or what you purchased your property for. And, and I, you know, it, ju it just gets perpetuated. Uh, in fact, this year at the Spokane Realtor Forum, I, I believe one of the realtors mentioned the same thing in the forum. And so when I became the assessor, one of the first things I did was I, I started looking for the state law that basically says words to the effect of thou shalt not disclose. And I really couldn't come up with anything. Now, I, I could not find a law that prohibits disclosure. Uh, what I did find was a law that actually says quite the opposite. Um, it, it is actually the, uh, the real estate license law. It's chapter 54, uh, excuse me, title 54, chapter 20, section 54-2083. It's in the definitions. It's under confidentiality of information. The last sentence says sold sold information is not considered confidential. And, and it's by that provision of law that I believe is what enables the realtors to perform a public service to essentially uh, let sellers know what the market price they can reasonably expect to get when they sell their house, when they do their CMA analysis. And also when they're working with buyers, buyers ask the same question, what price should I pay for this house? What should I offer? Um, again, the realtors will do a CMA analysis um, it's because they have access to that information, they can share that information. It's not confidential. Well, that also applies uh, in terms of sharing the information through like a, a, the, the agreement, the sharing agreement that we have with the MLS. Um, it really performs a public service. The public benefits by it. Uh, the public uh, buyers and sellers benefit by getting that information so they can strive to achieve a market price. And the public further benefits from it by the assessor's office being able to make more and more accurate assessments. If we do not rely on it exclusively, it is the lion's share of information, but we have uh, appraisers that go out there and search for information and get sold information from other means. As we know, uh, not all sales occur through the MLS. It's a smaller fraction of sales that, that occur outside the MLS. And we do knock on doors. We do have appraisers that knock on doors and do searching and we'll find other sources of sale, sales information. We pull it all together and that's what makes up our analysis. So that's kind of the elephant in the room, kind of, I, I appreciate you asking the question, Keith, um, but I, I'd like to see a day where we could um, just simply talk about it. It doesn't mandate that people have to disclose. After all, state of Idaho does not make um, uh, people it's not mandatory that they disclose their sale price. I guess, I think that's what makes Idaho a non-disclosure state. The fact that there is no law requiring it, uh, but it doesn't preclude it either. Um, and, and so, and I want to make it clear, I am not arguing in favor of, of mandating disclosure um, or of creating uh, an excise tax. Uh, many of the states surrounding us that actually require disclosure, um, they do that so that they can apply a tax rate. Um, Idaho has a levy rate system, and, and um, it, well, as, as Keith will explain when he gets into his presentation, uh, it actually is a better system, and it, and it smooths out uh, the impact of, of the changes in values. With that, I'll, I'll defer back to Keith. Um, I'm not sure if I covered everything you wanted me to cover, but I'm here for questions if you have any. Yeah, I think you did great. Is there, are, are you available for one or two questions before we, we let you go and get back to work? Um, sure. I'm available. Anybody have any questions that we want to ask our assessor? You have your you have your elected official right here at your beck and call. This is your opportunity. So to repeat that, that chapter. Oh, uh, the question was, Bela, could you repeat the chapter that is cited that that you cited that we don't have to? It's you don't yeah. have to. It's title fifty four. Title. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna That's I'm gonna make sure I didn't just quote it. I'll pull it up real quick. I believe it's title fifty four. Okay. Chapter 20, and I believe it's section 54-2083. And, and that section is actually the definition section. <coughs> the language that I was referring to is under 
under the definition for confidential information. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, we appreciate you stopping by and um, thank you so much. Well, I, if you don't mind, I'm just going to hang out. I'll let it play in the background. I'll go on. Mute. Yeah, by all means. By all means. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Well, thanks. That was great. Nice to have uh, our elected official here to give us that information. Mm -hmm. hey, we we'll have some fun with this. So I think that, you know, the elephant in the room was one thing, but also the emotion that's running out there. <laughs> too. And I know this, this, uh, Lunch and Learn got a, a lot of attention, and I think it's based on the emotion. We look at it on Facebook and we see it, and everybody's kind of, you know, up in arms and the pitchfork kind of mentality, and can't believe this, and my taxes are, are going to go up and what have you. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, why that isn't. Why I'm here is not to propagate that, promote that. That's not it. Uh, we love what uh, Bela does. We love what our elected officials do. It's great that we have them. They're needed and they're necessary and they provide that service he was describing. And, and it's important for us and our communities to be able to continue to flourish that way. The question really comes down to, and the county assessor's office, Bela's uh, office, allows you to rebut. And that's what the topic of our discussion is today, <clears throat> to rebut the value specific to your property. And so let's have a little fun today. You know, I wanted to talk about why we're here, and I think I just did a little bit, but it's Father's Day. And so I just want to say happy Father's Day to uh, <coughs> fathers out there. It's coming up on Sunday, and I'm a dad. I've got three kids, grown and what have you. My wife gave me my Father's Day uh, card early. It says, to my love. And it's really cool. She's open to cures, so it's a very emotional thing. And uh, if I do that, if you guys don't mind, it gives us a little closer to one another, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's do that. I'm going to read it to you because Caroline, I've been married 36 years, she loves me, I love her. This is not a Father's Day card. <laughs> this is the love letter from Baylin. It's the, it's the county assessor's love letter that I got regarding my value of my property going on, which is the emotional thing, kind of like the uh, real card I hope I get on Sunday, that we're all here for. I'll tell you another story too, you know a little bit, know a little bit about me and how the emotions all run. So here I am, I'll tell you a story. Here I am, I'm camping with my daughter when she's little, my wife and I were throwing a ball and uh, back and forth and the campers in this campsite are parked kind of like this in a semi-circle way, one camper after another. And I can't see down the ends in between these campers up where my daughter and my wife are. And I'm throwing the ball back and forth and Caroline's catching and handicapping, she's throwing them off. All of a sudden this horrific, terrible sound comes out between two of the campers up here and it's a dog fight. It's the, the most violent sound a dog is being killed. It's just being murdered by another dog. Horrific. And I go sprinting up there around the corner in between the, the campers, and I can see it. And there's a, a dad, and he's hitting this Rottweiler over the head with one of those pale metal buckets, hitting it over the head, and it's bouncing off. The moms have the two kids on either side pulling, and they face their campers where the doors face one another in this campsite. And the moms are huddling the kids back, and the, the, the bulldog, the, the family's bulldog, is chained to the tree, tied to the tree in the middle of the campsite, like it should be. The Rottweiler has wandered in and is killing at the tree this bulldog. It's got it down and it's killing it. And I run in there, I race in there, I instinctively run by it, get behind the Rottweiler, grab it by its legs and step and hurl it. As soon as I grab it by its legs, he took his focus off the bulldog, let go of the bulldog, and I threw it down the hill, out between the two campers rolled down the hill. Came back up. I moved to the end of the campus and I'm standing there and I'm doing this and he's coming at me, but he's still got his eyes on the bulldog and he's looking this way. He's trying to get by me. And on the third time he tried to get by me, I punched him in the head, brought his eyes up on me. And with the most, the biggest, loudest, guttural growl I could come up with, and, rawr, and just got down in his face like this. He backed off and he took away. Very emotional moment. I followed the Rottweiler to the campsite and we actually worked with the sheriff to get rid of the get that camper to leave because he let his dog go. So very emotional, um, but what, and this is not like that, but it's an emotional moment that we get this love letter and it sets us off a little bit. And I just want to say that it's my why. Why do I do the things like we're doing today? Why did I do radio for almost 20 years? Consumer advocacy, it's advocacy for accuracy. And so the value of your property in this love letter that you got, if it's not accurate, and we need to make sure that it is, we need to advocate for it. So as a consumer advocate, all of my career, and doing many things, I did a movie on it, uh, or a book, I've done some other things too, that that's my why. So fighting for the underdog. And so you may feel like, and your clients, if you're realtors, you have a lot of clients that are calling you, they may feel like they're disadvantaged and underdog, they're not having where to go. 
for Bale's still listening, there's, they invite you to call county assessor office and talk to them, but you can't get through. I've tried for the last four days and you just can't leave a message and you can't get in. They have it unplugged. <laughs> yeah, it's just a recording. I feel like they should extend the power. Yeah, I, I think they should probably give you a more time. But what I'm gonna talk about now is something you can implement quickly to help uh, Bale's office understand what the uh, nuances are of your particular property and what the attributes are of your property that aren't defined in a general assessment of your property. I'm going to talk about that. I've done this a couple of hundred times in my career and been successful 90% of the time. It has to do with empirical data, and they even talk about this. It must be, I think, the terminology that uh, the office uses is solid, credible evidence. So we're going to talk about accuracy based on solid, credible evidence. So that's my why. That's why I'm here. And again, helping your clients so that they don't think there's the, the assessor uh, against them. It's a process, but again, there is a way you can accurately describe the value that they don't have uh, information on. They invite you. They invite you to appeal. They invite you to uh, through a, a methodology to do it. And we're going to talk about that. So Keith, let's, yeah, let's go. So Mike, I have to be back here. You can just hit the, the forward button on your arrow keys on the bottom right of your keyboard, and I'll take you to the next slide. I was a lineman in college, dude. My, I have no hands. Uh, I'm looking for you to help me, but that's okay. You got it. Hit the, hit the space bar? Uh, yeah, yeah, that should work, too. Okay, let's see. <laughs> yeah. I, can be, I can be fine. Sorry. <laughs> Values up, levy rates go down, and I was talking to Kevin. Kevin is here, by the way, in the background, in the back of the room here, and he's from Pioneer Title. He worked at the assessor's office as well, didn't you, a number of years ago? So he's got great knowledge on this, and he was talking about that as well. And that's true. So in terms of the actual effect that's going to occur uh, to you is 3%. Uh, that's all that's going to happen. So the fact that your value went up to a million bucks and was 200 last year, it's really only going to affect you by 3% of whatever these taxes were last year, the algorithm that they use. So it's not a big deal, but I think the reason for accuracy in anything we do in life is that something in the future may change. And it may become important. So making sure that your property is, is uh, the metrics on your property right, identified properly with the assessor's office, I think is important. Is it going to result in anything right now? No, but because your values are likely going to be higher no matter what you have, no matter what attributes you have, because our market has changed and values have gone up. So no matter what, it's going to be higher. But uh, unless you've you know, taken something down, they even talk about that in their, in their brief that came out with the, uh, with the letter. Rebutting tactics and process, uh, we talked about that. The deadlines, I agree with you. I think that that should be extended. That would be a great thing to do. It's pretty quick. And what I'm going to describe involves a contractor, um, and it, it can take some time to put together. So it's something to do. And then we'll hold your questions, and we'll put those on the high-tech table, which is known as a sticky pad. We'll put those on there, uh, and we can ask those questions later. OK, and I'm going to push this button, see if it works. Can you talk? Woo-hoo! <laughs> I feel accomplished. If I go home right now, <laughs> my, my day is complete. So this is from Jill Smith, and she posted this. And uh, Kevin, thank you. Kevin gave this to me. Uh, she posted this. Uh, she is the uh, chief deputy chaser for Kootenai County. And she says, what well, values go up, the labor rates go down. And again, uh, that's because they're starting with a figure that they have to have for the budget, and they back that in. And that's what happens. So again, it's going to result in that 3%. So again, at the end of the day, is there anything to really panic about? And it's 3%. But again, the talk we're doing today is really about having accuracy in describing your property. Okay? Budget <coughs> uh, cap 3%, budget meetings or your valuation statement amend them. Uh, calculator and treasurer's website beginning in uh, July. I think we looked, did we look at that calculator? It, it's anything? live. Oh, I didn't send, yes. Uh, we'll, we'll send out an updated deck on this, but the website is on the updated deck. It, it's, it's on the presentation. Okay. I forgot to mail it to you. Okay, Sorry. very good. Yeah, but it is live. You can go on to the treasurer's website right now and click the hyperlink and type in your levy codes and all that good stuff. And it'll tell you what's going on there. Yep. So that's a good way to do that. Okay, moving on. We're gonna make this quick and hopefully get enough of a time to uh, ask some questions about it. Uh, so this is one of the things by law, the value established for the system must be in the 90 to 100 types of fair market value based on the property sales information. So they're gonna fall in that range based on that conglomerate, I'm gonna call it, or that, that uh, aggregate that comes from <laughs> all those properties in that particular uh, division or region that, that they're pulling from. Uh, it's actually called a what's the name for the GL geographic area. Geographic area. Thank you. Thank you. I need help with that too. I can run play one at a time. 
And so that's important that you understand that they have to do that. That's a law. So some of the things you can do, and this is described in the, in the information on the assessor's website, you can go there and you can find that these are some of the things you can put down to a rebut and change. So if you've got your square footage wrong, your land, your lot size, if there's additions and improvements that they don't know about, now those can work against you. They also have an appeal to fear on there that's in there. I always look for those types of things and arguments for the appeal to fear is three things. You know, you probably can go down, it can stay the same, or you know, God forbid, it could go up. So that's that appeal to fear. But again, additions, improvements will maybe cause your value to go up. Again. But again, we, we don't, I'm not here to say good, bad, or indifferent. I'm here to say, let's be accurate, because that's what we want, accurate representation. Uh, are your qualified exemptions correct? Make sure they are. Maybe they're not. Non-typical characteristics, those are the things we're going to talk about uh, in, in the case of errors. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, have an error. Uh, want to discuss your valuation, so rebuttal tactics. Paul, this is on the uh, top of the uh, website. You can go there and you can do this. And again, we're just joking about that. You can't really get into the phone number that nobody answers, so you have to go down. And I would, if, uh, if our assessor's on, if Bailey's already on there, it's still on again. I'd love for him to chime in when we talk about this, Keith, about the process, because the process is a little ambiguous for me. It's got step oh, yeah. one, talk to your assessor. Step two, it says, if it doesn't work, but it doesn't tell you what that process is, call it says, but do you go in? So if you were to go in with these characteristics and things there, maybe if you're listening, I'd love to chime in in a sec, that if you go in and see at the office, and that's step one, prior to it going to the BOE, what is that? And how is that, what is that outcome quickly, if you can describe it? And then moreover, do you, when, when they come in with those unique characteristics and changes that they want to make, um, are they using the BOE uh, sheet, even though they're not taking it to step two or three or four, whatever it was, for the BOE argument? Uh, are, you, are you waiting for me to chime in on that? Yeah, I'd like to <laughs> please. Thank you. I, I, okay, I, I, I didn't catch all the question. I got I had some distractions here in the office. I had you on mute. Um, let me I, well, let me ask very quickly, I'll help you. So in the format of the process in which to rebut the assessed value, it has the BOE sheet that you fill out, fill it in with information there. But that's, that is also described as phase two. In other words, if it doesn't work at the assessor's office to get that change, then go to phase two and use the uh, BOE form. But do you use the BOE form when you're making step one, going in and presenting the arguments to the assessor's office prior to going to the next phase, BOE argument? Okay, thank you for that question. I I, under, I think I understand it now. I think part of what might be a, a cause for that confusion or for some confusion there is really the the appeal process is a process that's managed and administered only by the commissioner's office, by the board of county commissioners, which the board sits as the board of equalization. Which you all already know that, but I think you know it was their office that created that information that's posted on the commissioner's website. Um, to answer your question directly, no, you do not need to fill out any form to come into this office, the, the assessor's office, to perform a review. We want to make it easy. Just come in, bring your assessment notice with you, um, ask your questions. If our front office, our, if our front staff cannot answer questions, we will bring up or call up an appraiser. Hopefully, it'll be the appraiser that worked on your on your property. They'll be able to answer your questions. And if after going through that process, if you feel that you still want to contest, and again, you, you need to, to meet that test that it that you can prove beyond, uh, you know, beyond doubt that, that there's an error on our part, um, then file an appeal. Um, you know, I don't want to discourage anybody from filing appeal, nor do I want to encourage them because it's, it does take a lot of work on the part of everybody. Um, but hopefully I've answered your question. Yes, and so filing the appeal would be the one that goes to the BOE when that form is filled out after you've met with your appraiser, your appraiser or met with them in person. And yes, Sean correct. wants to chime in real quick. Sean's our attorney on board here. Go ahead, Sean. Hi, Bella. This is Sean Glenn. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding clearly when a person comes into the assessor's office to uh, have the assessor review their evaluation, what the person is looking for is to perhaps show the assessor that there's a 
something incorrect on the evaluation. It's not an appeal. Am I correct? That is correct. I mean, so for example, if if our records show your property, your house is a two story home, but you really have a single story home. Well, obviously that's going to have an impact on your value and we need to get that right. Or if say maybe we show your property or your home as a 2500 square foot um, um, improvement and it's only a thousand square feet. Uh, well, obviously that's going to have an impact and we want to want to make that correction. Say, you know, any any material difference uh, of fact, uh, we want to know about that so we can make that correction and that change. And, and, and we have the power and the authority to do that up until the fourth Monday of June. After the fourth Monday of June, we can't con we can't make that change. It can only be made by the Board of Equalization, which is the Board of County Commissioners. And last question, what if those uh, uh, changes or those things that are reported inaccurately were just unknown facts, like, for example, uh, uh, problems with the home itself, material facts that don't make it a the standard of all the homes in this neighborhood, dysfunctionality, uh, the kitchen burned down, wh whatever it may be, I'm exaggerating, of course, but what if it's that type of evidence that they're bringing in to show that my house would not sell for this in today's market? Yeah, they, I mean, that's obviously something they need to come in and, and review it with the, with the appraiser. Um, we want to take note of any material fact that can have an impact. We want to get it correct. We want to get it right. Um, yeah, I, I believe the answer to your question is yes. Bring it in. We'll talk it over. We'll review it with you. And Bella, this is Sean again. I have just one more clarification. The mistake or the, the problem with the error in the evaluation needs to be as of January 1 of this year. It can't be something that happened in March, like the kitchen can't have burned down in March and affect last year's valuation. Is that right? Right. It's only things that occurred. Uh, co that's correct. We are looking at last year's value. So tw for 2022, it's the values that that uh, of the properties that were uh, that of the sales that we evaluated in the year 2021. Very good. Is your office equipped to handle people coming in? And what kind of wait time are you seeing now for at the desk if people do come in and want to make those arguments? Well, uh, you know, we try to get back to people within three days. Um, I think we're not quite meeting that mark right now because of the sheer volume. We are we are short staffed. Uh, we're not only short staffed up front in the front office, but we're short staffed among the appraisers. We we have a total of 17 positions for uh, the residential appraisal division. Uh, four of those are vacant right now, so we're down to uh, to 13. Um, commercial, we have we're fully staffed. Uh, as far as the ag timber, we're, we're down a uh, one appraiser in the ag timber area. Um, but other than that, we're, we're so I'd say we're you know we're down five people out of uh, um, about 23. So okay. So, so yeah. you're saying um, I have a question on Christine Broche. So you have this influx of people showing up at the assessor's office, and the deadline is the 27th. Why couldn't there be some type of extension? Um, because you can't handle thousands of people at this time from now until the 27th. Uh, okay, so as the assessor, I do not have the authority to abrogate state law. S state law has defined this problem, this this process. Uh, if, if there's going to be any sort of an extension, that would be something that would have to be authorized either in statute or by the Idaho State Tax Commission. Okay. Can I cue in on one thing really quick, Bela? I, I think if I heard you right, your authority as the assessor expires on Monday the 27th, but the 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 BOE could still take the case and review your your situation afterwards. Is that correct? That is correct. So we we have the power up until the fourth Monday of, of June, which this year is the 27th. And what what typically ends up happening is, you know, we try to get to everybody, but as the as the calendar winds down, as we start to get closer and closer to the 27th, um, we might end up we might begin telling people uh, just file your appeal. Um, and, and because, you know, because the point uh, that the lady made a moment ago, I, I don't remember her name, but um, yeah, you get close to the deadline, um, just based upon the sheer volume in a year like this, we may not be able to get to everybody to review them. 
And so, uh, you know, typically what we would say to people is uh, go file your, your appeal. <clears throat> oh, we got one more question. Yeah, I, I mean, this is more of a uh, individual question, but I've been a realtor for 25 years, and normally the assessor's value of a property runs behind, let's call it the true value, okay? Um, and I purchased a home last August, uh, and the appraised value on my tax uh, assessors is $100,000 over what I paid for it. So what you're saying is from August to January 1st, my property appreciated almost $100,000 from what I paid for. It. That's that's the, the reason I'm in here is the you know, nor, I mean, you're you're valuating my property for more than I, a hundred thousand more than I paid for it six months later. All right. Let's let's do this. Let's move on. I can help you with that. Okay, we're going to help you out. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. you know, uh, if there was if, if there was a question there, I I I I'd like to respond if you want me to respond to that. Um, Here we go. Yeah, go ahead. So I, I, I don't know your property. I don't know the particulars of your situation. You said you purchased it in August of last year. Is that correct? Yes. And, and so what, what happens is there's, there's, there's time adjustment of all properties. Uh, and, and so they do time adjust to a value as of the lien date. And the lien date is January 1st, 2022. So obviously some time has lapsed between August and December. Um, but again, I don't know the specifics of your property. Um, you know, I, I, I would want to have the, uh, the appraiser that actually did the work on your property, look at your situation or your scenario. Um, so I cannot account for any of the particulars at this point because I, I don't have that information in front of me. Sure. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate your uh, input and time here today. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So moving along, we I want to make you respect of our time. We've got an hour here, and I want to give some uh, opportunity for questions, what have you. So let's continue to move on because I want to get to the meat and potatoes. So here's what you have. Uh, you can go to in in person, and again by the 27th at 5 p.m. is necessary. My feeling is, and this is just my observation, predicated upon years of doing this stuff, is that I think you should use this form, fill it out, even if you're going to make the deadline in the event that because of staffing as Baylor to talk about and or just whatever logistical issues that, that occur, that this affords you, you've gotten it in in time to get it off to the BOE. And I think that there's also, you can mail it, post market by, it has to be in by uh, that time and give you an address as well to mail this in. So I would use this, even though it's not required for the first phase of review, do it anyway in case you miss that due to some other thing outside your control. Um, Let's do this. So there we go. Everybody has that. Let's go. Uh, no one can assess the office. We've kind of talked about that. Jump I, like I, don't all. I don't even need slides. I'm, could I, I, could I interject good. something? Could I yeah. interject? Um, I just would, would like to make sure that there's no confusion that on your advisement that people should just go ahead and use the form. Uh, if people come into our office with the form, I could see a potential confusion, at least on the part of our staff thinking that the people are coming in here trying to file the appeal with us. And so what I would right. recommend is work through the the uh, the review process without the form. However, if the property owner wants to, for quote unquote insurance purposes, uh, fill out the form and then turn it into the Board of County Commissioners, that would be a judgment call on the part of the property owner. I just want to make sure that we, you don't miss the opportunity to appeal to the Board of Equalization because the deadline on that is also the 20, 27th of June and, and also coincides with the appeal process with your department. So if those two things come to a uh, pinnacle, then I'm not sure how they uh, determine the chicken or the egg, which one do they do first and how do they make sure that they don't miss the opportunity to appeal. If your office, and again, it's my interpretation of what you said, Bail, if your office is bottlenecked and it can't get to those reviews in time due to staffing, then 
then they're out of luck to make the appeal to the BOE. Am I correct in that or incorrect? Yeah, appeal to the BOE, but but the only the thing I'm reacting to is you said for pro, for the first part of the process, use the form. And the only thing I'm interjecting is the form does not really apply to the first part of the process. Um, I think that yeah. might create confusion. Okay, understood. And I guess my question is, do you do the first part of the process and then uh, they don't hear or they run out of time for you and that time comes and goes the 27th, how do they get to the appeal on the BOE if they've missed that deadline by getting bottlenecked into the first part of the review with your office? Yeah, well, they, they should. Uh, the goal is for them to not miss the deadline. So the responsibility is on the part of the property owner to file their appeal at the Board of County Commissioners on or before the deadline, which is the 27th. The separate. So they haven't heard from, okay, so if they haven't heard from your office in the first days, by that time, a day before, they need to make the uh, BOE filing at that time. Yes, yes. So they try you first. If they run out of time, you haven't rendered an opinion yet due to time constraints, uh, what have you, they should go ahead and, and file the BOE at that time separately. Yes, that's correct. And I will add to that that there we have some incentive to make sure that we're meeting with as many people that we can before the BOE because the BOE, uh, the appeal process creates a lot of work. And so, you know, we, we actually have an incentive to try and get this resolved before it becomes uh, an appeal case to the BOE. Um, and so, so we, we, we definitely want to try and, and, and get things correct and resolved as quickly as possible before the June 27th. Okay, very good, thank you. Appreciate it. We're going to move on just so for time. I, I, I want to talk to you afterwards. I hope you have. Uh, errors, visual difference, and comparables. So, uh, one of the things they, uh, the, the, they, they have provided for you as well is to do a CMA. And the reason I jumped in and wanted to have this time with you all is that doing a CMA, look, I'm certified through NAR, National Association of Realtors of uh, Pricing Strategy Advisors. So, and the people who taught that class for NAR, National Association of Realtors was uh, were appraisers and so we're talking about appraisers we're talking about them teaching that class i am basically uh, because of that certification i'm better equipped to do a better cma a more accurate cma than any realtor that doesn't have one theoretically but at the end of the day a consumer can't really do this now, i know uh, real life cases Raina, someone who works here her mom and dad were trying to fill this out they don't know how to do a cma they don't know how to go do that how would you find that how do you find that data and so it's really difficult so what we're going to talk about here in a second is a way that you can accomplish what we're talking about, get the information into uh, the assessor's office and have a, a good argument for those changes that they just don't know about. And they rendered a general opinion about the value. So we're going back to the, the theme of accuracy. So additional different variables, uh, condition and char or characteristics, attributes of your home, positive or negative. Negative is going to bring it down. Positive, we're going to bring it up potentially as stated from the assessor's office as well. Well, well really quick on comparables. I, I think this is a great opportunity for all of us as real, real estate agents and mortgage professionals to, to have really high level conversations with our clients and see if they're in need of assistance. Some yes. of our clients are just gonna take this increase and happily move on with their life. Some of them are really going to need us right now. And I know it doesn't mean selling a house, but that's why our clients are our clients is for our expertise and what we do for them. So I think this would be a great opportunity great. to reach out to your guys' clients and just, you know, be an advocate for them. It's in my notes right here to say that. <laughs> gotcha. So, so <laughs> You're welcome. You can see my notes from over there. Um, but we talked about that. It's awesome. That's what you should do. So if, if your realtor is in here, absolutely reach out to your clients. Encourage your clients to talk to you. You can help them out. I think it's a service that we should be might help them out. So here's an example. This is a real life example. And this is home with defects. And so the uh, photos in the descriptive brief, we're going to show you the paper. We're going to give you, when you leave here, and anybody online listening, watching, if you have given us, given Keith, and filled out, we captured your information, your emails. We'll email. We'll be emailing you the template how to do this thing. So I'm going to move through this quickly. It's very self-explanatory. When you get the the executive summary, you'll be able to figure out. Oh, okay. Because I'm going to give you a real a real one that's developed for this home, and it uh, it, it talks about the defects. So these are things that the that they don't know about. For example, the foundations fall apart in this house. And of course, if anybody knew that, and how many realtors? Ex all of them? All of them. Everybody is. No. Well, I had well, no well, idea. I would have killed time. One time. <laughs> um, the, uh, 
But I, I mean, you, if you know this, are we talking about that? Is that a set value in any way? Yeah, yeah I think it does. No, but, but the assessor doesn't know that. And so does uh, yeah, this, probably. yeah, this is the entry to my home, by the way. My front door is right down here on the ground. It's really cool. Um, but it's, you know, you have failing mortar, you have the foundation, it's all foundational, foundational issues that are, are significant that uh, would be buyer. And again, the description that uh, the, they have here from the assessor's office very quickly is the term that says market value, which is, uh, pardon me, market value, which is, you know what, I'm going to paraphrase, but what a willing buyer would pay and a willing seller would take in a normal market, uh, given, you know, that they have the ability to buy it with financing or cash and the, the, the two are willing to contract at that level, what would they pay for it? That's market value and that's what the assessor office has done. Well, again, that didn't, that, that wouldn't define the market value if the assessor didn't know about those foundational problems and other things that are attributes that affect the quality of the house from you being able to sell it at the value. So that's one thing. So here is the executive summary. It talks about this property. It's one, two, three South Main Street. Who sold that property, by the way? Okay. Anyway, it's a fake house. Um, <laughs> and so this is the <laughs> this is the uh, this is the executive summary. So it's got uh, the brief in it. It talks about the abstract in it. It has the summary. It has the executive summary. A part of it that uh, has where uh, our, our contractor Ryan would come in because Ryan would provide a third party disinterested party. They talk about it, you know, it's, it has to be empirical and it has to be um, uh, data that's credible. Well, we're not credible ourselves. Now, you know, again, I'm, I'm being a little extreme on this, but we're not. It, we're, it's subjective, uh, it's not objective. It's objective unless third party, somebody who's rendered an opinion that's in that profession that knows it. We're emotional. And we talked about in the beginning, it's an emotional thing that's going on out right there. And, it, you know, it really shouldn't be, but it is because people see that number and it freaks them out. And so, uh, kind of like me and my Father's Day gifts. Is really cool. <laughs> Um, anyway, that's uh, that's what this is, and you're going to get a copy of it. Uh, executive summary here it is. Starts out, goes through executive summary, and then it lists all the things. So each one of these things, and it's it's alphabetized, so they correlate to issues and costs associated with fixing those. They would, if you were selling this, if the, you were selling your home, you would have to disclose these material defects, and it would affect a buyer's opinion. It's called psychographics. They're they're interests, attitudes, and opinions of the value of the house. So the psychographics are affected when that happens. So uh, third-party documentation, contractor bid, real estate, thank you again, Keith. Real estate CMA would be great. And this is Ryan's information here. And he's gonna be around here after we get done to talk to him about how he can help anybody that's interested in, in getting those types of bids. Let me move on, I think. So one, one other thing, uh, um, Gentleman in the gray shirt, right? Oh, that's great. Yeah, what was your name again? Poncho. Poncho. So one other thing that you can bring with you as a third party document is your appraisal from your purchase and oh sale, yeah. right? So you can take that, if you got an appraisal done in your purchase yeah. and sale, you yeah. can take that in and say, hey, I bought an, uh, in April or August, 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 August. August, here's my appraised value. And you know, let me know what your time value adjustments were from August until January, because you know, when you're counting out $25,000 a month, that sounds maybe on the high side. I don't know what your purchase and sale price is because it's all predicated don't on know that, where right? you are. So, so that would be a great third party document to take. Yeah, okay. And but your agent, agent could help you with that uh, time value. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but the, okay, we can do it later. Oh, yes. Yeah. Are you an agent? Yeah, because we've got I a lot of people. Your hand up. Oh, he did. Pardon? I didn't see your hand up, I'm blind, but. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Put your glasses back on. <laughs> Yes, please. Another awesome third party documentation. I know that it's been a really hot, hot real estate market here. And so a lot of people are coming in and they need to have cash and they think they're going to be protected because this is, it came from other places where buyers are protected and well, yeah. in Idaho, it's not. Something that you may be able to help your clients with is your home inspection. If they were smart enough mm. to wait for that short period of time to get a home inspection. Because then you can take that home inspection with the photographs to your contractor and say, how much would it cost to fix this? And then you'd have a perfect, just 
very concise ability to show the assessor this is what it really cost. I had to buy in a hot market because we were refugees from California or wherever. <laughs> But this is what it, it really is yeah. valued. So that would be another third party documentation that I would highly suggest if you have clients lucky enough to have one that you put in this. And Very some inspection software includes the cost of repairs. That's right. right. Yeah. We're starting to do that. Right. Okay, uh, recap deadlines. Accuracy is the goal 3% max anyway. Assessor's office, then the board equalization deadline for people <coughs> review. And the assessor is the same, isn't it, Keith? It's 27th, right? Yeah. The yeah. Office. Both the same, yeah. which is why what prompted me to ask those questions. Uh, questions, pull out your uh, little tech and uh, read off from your technology. Can you provide? Yes. Just out of curiosity, in Idaho, do the assessors values typically run spot on? I mean, are they typically lagging twenty percent below value? Or what's what's the I can't, answer, the, I can't answer the, the question. Answer. I give you a general <laughs> response that uh, they are uh, a generalization of a geographical area. And so in and of itself, they're not going to be spot on for your home. Thank you. Kevin, jump in. I hope a 100% market value state. Mm -hmm. Market value state. If it sells for 800, it should be assessed somewhere around, around 800. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we're good. But again, that the, what's on the, our love letters may not reflect what your house is really right, worth. Right, right. And yeah that's why this accuracy meeting today is talking about a modality that you can use to help get the information to Baylor's office so they can make a uh, an accurate uh, rendering of value on your property yeah that's one other system. thing too is there, there's almost a hundred thousand parcels that they have to assess right and, and they're on a five-year cycle so they're going to visit every house once every five years so if there's been a fundamental change expansion or retraction of the house maybe an outbuilding is no longer there that was assessed and, and they don't know about that because they haven't been on your doorstep in the last four years because you're coming up next year right. that they would just blanket statement the empirical evidence that they've had on the last yes. visit and they, they just apply that to today okay, we got about 10 more minutes uh, yes please you got your person um what do you mean by the three percent? Keith, I'll let you explain. Yeah, so so think about the budget of your uh, and Bela, if you're still here, chime in too. So budgets are set, right? We have a certain tax base to run the county. We have a certain tax base to run the cities and municipalities and the schools and all that good stuff. No one budget can go up more than three percent in a year, right? So, so if we extrapolate and use the dis distribution effect of, of multiplication, right? If every single budget and every single levy rate went up 3%, it's going to say the tax base total went up 3% and we still have the same amount of houses, right? So we have to now take that 3% increase on total budget and disperse that amongst the same tax base. So the tax base that we're all paying into on our property taxes can only go up 3%. Right. That there is a couple carve outs for special levy assessments that get passed and, and then expansion growth for uh, what do they call them um, expansion um, levies that they do. But for the most part, we can't go up more than 3%. Right. So if we extrapolate that number and everything stays the same and things are equal amongst all the homeowners, your tax bill is not going to go up more than 3%. That's absolutely so, correct. So would that be? So, oh, yeah. that's, for, that's for primary resident, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's for all tax base, right? But make sure your exemptions are right. If you if you did have a non-owner occupied, now you are owner occupying that, you need to get your homestead exemption. If we, we had one example that somebody is on lease land and they're getting charged land um, uh, on lease land, that that's definitely something that needs to get down to the assessor's office. So those things need to be taken into account too. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Just for quick question. Quick points as well. Remember that the assessor's office has a 90 to 110 percent wiggle room of your assessed value, so they can put your assessed value within that range, and they probably won't change it, even if you change, even if there's a change in value that falls within that range. That's the first thing. The second thing is, is when we're Very talking perfect. about board of equalization. We're talking about county taxes, not school district, not library, not irrigation, 
not fire district, not any of those other districts, the assessor's office can change the county assessment. Those other things are there by levy. Very good. We'll also another question. Yes. I guess I wasn't clear that the tax assessor's office was provided access to the MLS. Yeah, yes. Yeah. That's what I heard too. Yeah, absolutely. And I didn't. Since I didn't. I, what did they say? Ninety-three. Ninety-three. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> I close a lot of properties at Pioneer Title, and that's at the closing so, table. So it's interesting. Just as a point of uh, conversation. Because I know at closings, I, we always tell the escrow officers, say, they don't, have the paper. Don't, yeah, the paper, don't tell them what you paid for the house. Mm -hmm. So the question is, does it really matter? Yeah. No. Yeah, no. not. I, I had no idea that they had access. It doesn't really matter, does it, I guess? Mm -hmm. so, You're cool. non-disclosure, you think. Cool. Anybody else? I was just going to look at Every five years, but yet this kind of went out as a blanket. I dealt with them last year. Had to get, we had refinanced, had the appraisal, someone's on vacation. I went to the office multiple times. So I, I they couldn't even help me last year. It, it was a laborious uh, task, wasn't it? Let it's alone impossible. this year with the, everybody being inundated. So yeah. I, I, did they just send it out a blanket to everybody then that your taxes are raised? It's not every five years now in the cycle, or are we all in the same cycle? Well, well hold on. The, let's, let's make sure we're clear on the, the five-year mandate is they have to physically be at your house once oh, okay. every five years. Yeah. Their oh. ability to reassess your value can happen annually. Okay. Yeah, that so because they have to come to market with our, our values from a... a and it has to be every year for every single parcel because this has to be approved through the state tax commission. So locally we assess, and then it goes through the state, state tax commission. January one, they have to make sure it's within the compliance between ninety and hundred ten percent. If it's not within compliance, then the state can come in and put the values of whatever they want, and the taxpayers have no recourse. That's happened in Bonner a few years back. Wow. Additionally, I want to just put point this out: our tax bills don't just come out in May. They came out in November. So no, from November to now, we have that period of time to look at when, you know, what's different in our taxing uh, evaluations. So great point. Next year, don't wait Good till point. June or May. Remember November. Well, the other thing on that, your statement includes your budget ratification dates for all your different um levies on there on the bottom it tells you when all those different groups are meeting yeah. to ratify their budget so if you want to get involved please attend yes, right. anybody else any questions like thank you for coming question and about the homestead you. exemption oh well, so it's my understanding can you hear me yep we can okay so it's my understanding that the homestead exemption needs to be applied for in person if you purchased your home and you're a primary resident is there a way to lessen the traffic at the assessor's office and do it online? No, it's, and it's the homeowner's exemption, which is different than a homestead. Yeah, yes, I, I misspoke. Sorry, I misspoke. <laughs> yeah, the, the homeowner's exemption has to be done in person. There are other ex exemptions though. For example, there's a 100% service disabled veteran exemption that can be applied for. This is something that can help a, a, someone who is disabled as a result of their service in the military to 100% to have an exemption on their property. And it includes the ability to have an exemption on mobile homes as well as real property. Um, if the service person dies and they have a spouse who's living in that on that property, that spouse is entitled to the exemption, but this exemption has to be applied for and renewed every year. Mm. And there are other exemptions that you can find out about um, on the Idaho State Tax uh, Department Is website. There's a, I think there's just a little one as well. Isn't there? Uh, there could be. I, I don't want to misspeak, <laughs> but there could very well be. Okay. Well, I want to say thanks for coming in. I'm Mike Hobbs again. And we have Keith Fitch in the back. And uh, we have Sean and we have Brian. And they're here. If you want to sit around and ask any questions, you can. And uh, we'll be sending out this format, this template for the executive summary if you want to use that. And I did want to let you know that the Bulldog survived and lived. Oh, oh good. Yay. Oh, good. There, there, was, there was a vet in the campsite that did a trip to it. had a ton of puncture holes. 
and uh, they did save his life. So, I just, good for awesome. you. There was a question on. Is there a chance there I can a... ask one more question? Yeah, sure. go ahead. Okay, um, when we got our assessment, I noticed on the form letter that came with it, it talked about the circuit breaker. And it talked yeah. about um, the maximum amount for um, people being able to receive this circuit breaker. Their property could not be valued over 300000 Did I understand that right? Go ahead. The circuit breaker program is not just for the elderly. It has to do with income. It has to do with medical. Right. It has to apply so for I, every single year. It has to be done by April 15th. So if one does not qualify this year, you should go ahead and try to qualify next year because things do change. I, I understand that. But I, was, I have one particular person, and I'm sure there's others, that he filled mm -hmm. out his circuit breaker and he qualified for it. Now he gets an assessment that puts his house up over $300,000 and now he doesn't get the circuit breaker? Is that correct? You're asking is the circuit breaker based on value of the property? I think that was your initial question. Is it based on value of the property? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we will table that and find the answer. Okay, because that, that to me is, uh, we've got all this excess money statewide and everything, and now they're going to penalize people because the values of their house goes up, their mm -hmm. income does not, and now they right. can't get the circuit breaker because the value is too high. Right. Never right. once have I ever heard about that. I think, okay. like I said before, it, things change every single year. So, okay, I, well, I really agree with Tina. I'm I'm experiencing the same with Tina, so I just am concerned with, um, you know, senior citizens on fixed incomes, and now they're yeah. not qualifying, and yeah, they're getting, yeah. they, you know, they're being put in a really compromising position. These, these are great questions. We're going to find the answers for you, and we'll uh, post mm -hmm. those and get those to you so you can go. And a lot of times, your area council on aging can assist those people. Oh, good point. So look at well, look in your area council on aging who can assist in answering some of those. Do you want to give your number out? Oh, okay. okay, but I mean he's done his homework as far as getting uh, qualified, but it's going to be the value of his home that's going to kick him out of there. Yeah, that, that would be unfortunate. I think that's beyond the scope of where we are for this particular yeah. presentation, <laughs> but I think we're happy to get the information to you through the email that comes out after we're done here. But thanks for your All question. Right. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, I have Thank a you. Let, let's end it on, let's end it on again, uh, is advocacy, is accuracy. Uh, a lot of emotion running out there about what's happened. Keep it calm, keep it simple. It's not going to affect us that much. Again, this is a unique situation. We'll have to figure that out. But again, for a general assessment of taxes, it's not a big deal. Again, accuracy is the thing to do. Okay. Oh, was that Baylor? I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I stepped out for a minute. I came back in and I heard a comment being made that we'll try to get answers for that. I hope I was not, while I was out, that I did not miss a question that was directed at me. Uh, I will I will send you an email and you can point me in the right direction to find the senior exemption uh, for the circuit breaker. Senior, if, um, yes. may I ask you to repeat the question? What was the question? Yeah. So if, if the value goes up over $300,000, does a senior citizen lose the circuit breaker ability to get that exemption? So the, uh, what happened in, in the year 2021, state legislator passed House Bill 389. And that was kind of a, 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 a kitchen sink uh, mixture of all kinds of um, uh, legislative changes. Um, but, it, but among all the changes that was made in House Bill 389, it addressed the circuit breaker program. Um, it, um, I believe it adjusted the income level qualification. Don't quote me on that, I might have that wrong, but it did create um, um, uh, another, a secondary aspect uh, whereby um, people are disqualified from the program if their home values were at or above 125% of the median value. That was the original legislation. That did get changed this year in the 2022 legislative session by House Bill 480, which was passed and was approved 
and it was made retroactive back to the 1st of January 1st, 2022, and it increased 125% to 150%. Um, the, the value calculation of, you know, what the first question is, what is the 150%? What is that value? And I believe it's, uh, I'm looking for the report right now. It's 100, and, I'm sorry, it's $548,000 is the median price now. That, that applies for the qualification of the circuit breaker. And to apply that, the, the 150% um, um, qualification, if your home was valued at $824,682 or more, you would not qualify. Okay, gotcha. So okay. it's well above the 300 that she was asking about. Yeah. yeah. And so, so, so but the way that works is, is great. We, we encourage all seniors or all people who are on the, the the uh, circuit breaker to continue to apply for it. It's the state that will review this. The state tax commission is the uh, agency that decides, and then they will issue letters to people who do not qualify. Gotcha. Good. So good. Good. thank you. Appreciate you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Much, thank you. If you have any questions, you can email us. Uh, I think we have all our contact information in the deck and also uh, through various uh, mediums, right? Keith, yes. You can get a hold of us. You have any questions, please direct me. Keith and myself, and appreciate the panel. Appreciate you being here. Kevin, Kevin's a wealth of knowledge. If you haven't used Pioneer title, you use him. He's great. He's very knowledgeable. He's really a funny guy. Right on. Thank you all. Thank you, guys.